page on Drum Bass TV. This is Bailey representing Metal. This is you, Turkey. This is Goldie for Drum and Bass, whatever it is. This is DJ Storm representing Metalheads on Drum and Bass Arena. I have to say that every track at Metalheads is a Metalheads moment, and it's been a very hard choice. Beach Drifter from Ruffage Crew. Because I don't really think anybody expected Goldie to make that kind of track, especially as Ruffage Crew. Okay, as Goldie and Metalheads, he makes those kind of tracks, but Ruffage Crew is normally the harder side of Goldie. And um, I think it was a big surprise. And I think, again, Goldie can just rip out your emotions, just the king of the pad and the king of the chord, and that for me was just awesome when I heard it, so that's a favourite of mine. First one for me is probably Stone Killer by Sorcerer X, which for me was a, a big tune there. It's just the fact it was so different, and you know, for Metal Haze to put that tune out and make a stand so you know, I think it made a, a big impact on the scene, whether people agreed with it or not, it was a just different to what was out there at the time. First tune, um, Adam F. Metropolis. Big tune, man. When that came on back in the days of Blue Note, man, which is actually just around the corner from here, um, that was the first time anyone had used that kind of real atmospheric sound in the Metalheads track, man. It was like you're surrounded in this like big, big kind of like uh, really trancey kind of sound, and it was like. It was real futuristic, man, when that came forward, man. Adam F played that, when Adam F drew that tune, that was like, yeah, this is something different. Especially because considering at that time he was making a lot of jazzy stuff. Wasn't expecting that from him at all, man. Drums, Doc Scott, an absolute killer. Um, it's ridiculous. When he mixed it down, he never had a desk to do it. He just did it, and he's got the most outrageous EQ on it. <laughs> And the point of still being one of the hardest track records to, to mix, it's all over the place. Because the vocal speeds up and slows down in the middle with the drums, 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 drums. And it's just like, where the fuck, hello, out. And you're waiting for it to just collide into a car crash or pure heaven. Um, I think it's just well, such a, it's a poignant track because it's just completely B-boy flavour. Next one, Angel Cell by Dillinger. Just again, I think, because that to me is one of the most pivotal tracks for Dillinger. I think there was kind of slightly a new sound emerging from Dillinger at that point, and I think Angels Fell just typified all those new sounds that he was dealing with at the time. And I think, again, it was a very technical track and a very big track, but it had that beauty that Dillinger can cross, you know, kind of rough with the smooth. And I think that one for me stands completely the test of time. That whole EP, but that one in particular. Angels Fell by Dillinger, uh, strictly because sheer darkness of the tune. I just loved the intro and the way it dropped and how heavy it was. You know, with Dillinger's B-line, the tune was just, it just came together nicely with those atmospheres and that. Angels fell, I guess, because it was a, a poignant track for Dillinger. And it was it was something that I'd always loved, Blade Runner, that whole kind of vibe. And just the way he just took that vocal. And also because before that, I think, was Manslaughter made a film? Yeah, yeah. I'd made a track called Manslaughter that was unreinforced, which was sampling from the same film. Haha, <laughs> publishing, get me. <laughs> um, and I think I'd always been spooked out by that. And to hear someone take something else from another angle from that film was kind of what really, what really, I really loved. Dillinger, Armored D, is that right? Is it Armored D? Nice one, Chris. Armored D, man. That is just, the beats in that are so hard. Like, it's like concrete, man. Sounds like a guy walking around with big concrete shoes on, you know what I mean? It's like it fully um, encompasses the metalhead sound, you know what I mean? For that era, you know what I mean? That was on the Platinum uh, Breaks Volume 1 album. That's the best tune on there, man. Like, it had all the just classic warped bass sounds on it. It was just out there, man. Bit of an obvious one for me, but it was uh, Pulp Fiction. Again, the tune was just so different and. Just the bass line on that tune was just unbelievable. First time I heard it, I think, I can't remember what it was, but I was in a club and it just blew me away. The bass line it just blew me away. And, then, and again, so different to what was going on at the time. Swing time from Hidden Agenda. Just because I think Metalheads really kind of put Hidden Agenda on the map and they were something very different than anybody heard coming from a kind of soul funk kind of vibe, northern soul kind of links. So I think for, um, Metalheads to have picked up on that, I think, was very clever for a start. And I think everybody was very shocked 
by maybe Hidden Agenda coming out on Metalheads, but that, I think, once again showed Metalheads' diversity and that Metalheads have never been afraid. If Goldie likes something and he believes in it and he hears potential, then he's not afraid to put his label's name behind it. Source Direct's remix of Dark Metal has to be one of the best remixes done of one of my own tunes because it was all about the 64 bar drop in the back with the mentasm, which was like ridiculous. It's just like, what, where the fuck is this going? And, and it was such an area of where Dark was. It was a really beautiful kind of way they did that. Cryptic Minds and Neon Switch, you know? Yeah? Hide the tears. Up until that point, when that tune came out, because like, you know, the Metal Hoss label went quiet for a little while. Uh, and we was coming back with a, few, a lot of tunes, and that was, it was that particular tune I said, yeah, that's the Metalhead sound, but it's like the new 2005 look, you know what I mean, updating, it was, it was absolutely just, uh, just they made it perfectly, you know? everything that Metalhead should be in 2005 for me in that tune. It was too dark for some people, but I was just like, you know, my attitude is you've got to hear that tune, and I just played it as well, okay. Waxed, which has brought it right up to date with DK and Lee. I mean, I would have gone for a Wax Doctor track, but I think that one just bringing it up to date that Metalheads is out there still doing something pretty exceptional. I think if you're a lover of Wax Doctor, which I truly, truly was, and I mourned the day that he left this scene, really, because I felt maybe he wasn't respected as much as he should have done, should have been. And I think now, when you have all this kind of new musical kind of stuff going on, it would have been nice to see Wax Doctor to be a part of it. But he's still alive, courtesy of DK and Lee. This one it wasn't actually on Metalhead, it was on London Records FFRR, but it was a flip to Inner City Life remix that Pesho done. It was called Sea of Tears by Goldie. Uh, strictly because the emotions behind that tune is just a really emotional track. It's just, again, it was just so different to anything I've ever heard, and still to this day, I haven't heard a drum bass tune anything like it. Future Cut, Obsession. Um, when I first heard that, I thought it was Goldie as well, but you can tell it's you know, very influenced by the Goldie sound. Um, typical kind of like, real kind of sparse breaks with like um, old school metalhead samples on it. I can't really describe it man, but it's just definitely one of the... Why do you think it's overlooked? Because I didn't hear that many people playing it that much, you know what I mean? I think it was the right speed, but the, um, the pace of the track probably didn't sound as hype as the tunes that were around at, the, at that time. So maybe people just thought, oh well, you know, it might slow the crowd down a bit, we won't go on and play that one. Yeah. It's a shame man, because it's just it's a bad tune man. Why this guys, because obviously for me, there's a big story behind that, which people don't really realise. It was like, I was doing copy of some drugs. It was a point where I was, I was really doing a lot of, of mad things, and I remember doing it in a place called Made of Vale, and I was doing Ghost the Original. I always remember, doing a sweep by on the desk and I just did a mute and I muted certain things and just let it run. I forgot that I did it because I had a tape of chemistry at the same time and I had Ghost Original, the whole thing. And I remember playing the dad and I remember being at home and I found this other version which was the Riders Ghost, which was a VIP that I gave to Groove and I completely forgot that this was on there. And I remember being at Roast and it was when it was at uh, Carry Cross Road, there was a breakfast club or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember Ryder playing it there. And it, I said, what the fuck is this? Because it was like, oh, it's another version. <laughs> and I'm like, where the fuck is this? This isn't the one I gave him. And it completely freaked me out. And he said, because I gave him the dad. And there's three things on there, but what, there was no ID on this particular track. And he just randomly found it on the fucking dad. Yeah, another track I'm going to mention, uh, not because it's one of my favourite tunes on Metalheads, but just because it was special for me, was my track Patience. Uh, strictly for the fact that it got me signed to Metalheads, um, and to me that was a big, that was a big part of my career, and that tune will always be important to me. Then your sound by J Magic. I just think because you know J Magic was Goldie's kind of wonder kid, and you know he kind of discovered him, and I think your sound was just one of the most perfect executions of the aim and break ever. Digital Niagara has to be. Because you play it now and it's so slow, but it sounds so fat, the beats of it. The thing you got to understand is with the Metalheads back catalogue, yeah, um, it's like a diary, you know what I mean? You pick out a tune and it, remem it reminds you of a certain like, time and where you was and who you was with and what happened around you in the club or whatever. That's why I have to cuss people when they sell their records, you know, and like, you're selling your diary, you know what I mean? 